Welcome to Hopeful Conversations and I'm Vicky Montague and today I'm joined by Ian Watson who and is another person who has only recently kind of come into my awareness I guess um, and he has a very interesting story I guess to share in that when I was looking for people to come and speak in this series I guess I had imagined that I would talk to people who had health challenges that they had in some way overcome and seen something different about. And Ian contacted me and he said, well, I haven't seen a doctor in 43 years. And he just said to me now, you know, it was a bit tongue in cheek, kind of, you know, I don't really qualify for this, for this conversation. And as soon as he said that, I just thought, wow, how hopeful is that? that we could potentially go through our lives and never see a doctor and to, to look at our health in a completely different way and, and approach it in a very different way than we've kind of been told we have to, which is there's something wrong with you, go to the doctor and get it fixed. So I'm really fascinated to hear what Ian has to share today. Um, and I wonder maybe, Ian, if it might be worth you just introducing yourself a little bit more um, and, you know, telling us how on earth you've gone 43 years without seeing a doctor, because I think that's amazing. <laughs> OK, thank you. Yeah, thanks for inviting me. And um, I, I suppose I should qualify that straight away by saying I'm not claiming I've never been sick. <laughs> in 43 yeah. years yeah because i have i've you know i've gone through stuff and fortunately recovered but with other kinds of help yeah. um but this and it's not something that i'm you know i'm not kind of boasting about the fact that i've not seen a doctor it's just become my in a way my normal mode is that i haven't i've got in the habit of not going to the doctor as a first part of call so whichever part of call I've gone to, you know, first, second, third has has helped me enough. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not saying I would never go to a doctor. Yeah. Or you know, if I need, if I really genuinely felt that I needed to, of course I would. So I wanted to just say that right off the bat. But um, this only occurred to me this last year when we're in the midst of whatever it is we're in the midst of. I, I you know, I saw a lot of people that. I know um, some getting very frightened, you know, wondering what to do in response to this um, malevolent virus that was inflicting misery on everyone. And the first thing I noticed was that I wasn't freaked out by it in a way that a lot of people were. And nor were quite a few of my friends who work in the homeopathic, homeopathic or holistic healing um, field. And in fact, they were very busy, you know, they were helping a lot of people and uh, seeing their business really take off. And I, th I just reflected on it. I thought, well, you know, if people weren't so f afraid, that that alone would change the situation. You know, I just saw there was a, a pandemic of fear as yeah. much as anything else was happening. Um, and I, and I, it got me reflecting on how come I'm not, <laughs> you know, I'm not so caught in that. <clears throat> And that was when the thought came to me, well, Ian, you haven't seen a doctor for 42 years. And 41 and a half years ago, I started to learn homeopathy and uh, holistic healing. And, and I just started to join the dots in my mind. And it occurred to me that that very early exposure to a holistic way of thinking about health <coughs> had, had really served me well throughout my life. <clears throat> it given me a kind of a perspective, which I felt um, it enabled me to just to see these things differently and to respond to them differently as and when they show up, whether it's in my life individually or now it seems to be something that's happening on a bigger scale. And I thought, you know, that's, that's something that I wish other people knew. Mm -hmm. It's not that they need to have learned, you know, all the detailed things that I've learned, but if people just had that different relationship to health and disease that in, in itself would be helpful that's that was the kind of seed of this uh, this whole conversation i was having with myself initially <laughs> uh. you know when it just floated in but in terms of my background i when i was in my teens um and that was the last time i saw a doctor so i'm 58 now i was 15 
and I had, um, I remember I had a cold which turned into a sinusitis and it was really, really, it was the first time I can remember such pain, you know, it was really agonizing pain. It was in my jaw and my teeth and everything. And my mom took me to the doctor and he spent, I mean, it must have been less than five minutes and uh, yep, sinusitis and he was scribbling the prescription out before I'd even sat down, you know, and it was painkillers and antibiotics. I remember really clearly. And I remember that the, the instructions were the antibiotics had to be taken, I think, for 10 days. So it's like, it's like you must finish the course. And, and I started on them. And within about 48 hours, the inflammation started to recede. I started to feel better. And I thought, OK, that's it. I'm not going to take the rest. <laughs> so that gives you a clue as to my kind of rebellious spirit, I suppose. Was already, you know, I just figured, like, my body can deal with the rest. Even at that age, I had that kind of a sense that it didn't make sense to me to keep taking something when I was feeling better. So that was, yeah, that was the last visit to, to a GP or any kind of doctor that I had. And I, around that time, I was starting to explore things like food and nutrition just for myself out of my own interest. Um, I was playing with being a vegetarian, which was really tricky for my mom because, you know, it was very traditional kind of meat and veg family sort of thing. So it, it was partly just, I think, just to make her life difficult, you know, in terms of <laughs> what she could feed me. Um, but, uh, you know, I was, in, I was genuinely interested in it. I was exploring, um, you know, what different minerals and vitamins we, we need. All of this was due to me. It was just a, a topic of interest. And then I came across a book which was like an A to Z of alternative therapies. I bought it in one of those remainder bookshops. And I just read this cover to cover. And it was, you know, when you find something that just grabs you, it's like this is a really a topic of interest. And I can't tell you where that interest came from, but I read that book cover to cover and then started again, read it again, cover to cover. Wow. And then I started highlighting the ones that really interested me the most. So, you know, it started at acupuncture and it went through to <laughs> whatever was at the end. And somewhere, somewhere in the middle was homeopathy, which was yeah. what really grabbed me at that time. And um, I just started to uh, acquire knowledge about homeopathy, herbs, um, also flower essences. I, I bought myself a set of the bark flower remedies while I was still a teenager. And I started uh, practicing on my mom and my friends, anybody who was open to being a guinea pig. Um, so there was a natural interest there, I think, for me, right, you know, from an early age. And what I started to learn when, when I went into homeopathy, most people who are not familiar with it will maybe at least have heard of something like Arnica, you know, remedy for bruises. And you know, they might think that that's great, that's helpful for certain things. And I thought that initially, I thought things like homeopathy were probably helpful for certain things, but then there'd be lots of other things where you'd need real medicine. Yes, you know, yes. and a lot of people still have that, that attitude. Yeah. What I discovered when I, when I finally went to train, I discovered you could actually train to be a homeopath. This was years later when I was uh, 20, 21. So I'd been studying it kind of privately, my secret hobby for a few years thinking that it was something that had died out because all the books were very old, you know, they were written a century ago. And then by a series of amazing random coincidences, I actually bumped into someone who, um, when he took his jacket off, he's wearing a sweatshirt that said College of Homeopathy. And it's like the eyes nearly popped out of my head. <laughs> and uh, I was like, there's a College of Homeopathy? Where is it? Wow. He said, yeah. yeah, it's in London. So that was it, I'm moving to London. You know, I lived in the, in the North of England at this time. There was no question in my mind. It's like, I'm going to London to study homeopathy. So I quit my job and off I went. And when you train in, in homeopathy, so that was, you know, three years of training and then clinical training and then developing my own practice, you start to do, and you come out of that, you discover that you're still, you're, to, you're a total beginner. Because it turns out that this subject has been around for 200 years and there's so much more to it than you would ever imagine. Um, is that like the depths to which it reaches are, are just incredible. And you start to realize that it, 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 there are literally hundreds of thousands of homeopathic doctors in India, where it's very integrated with the, with the health service there. And they treat everything homeopathically. They're treating um, all the common things that we would treat. You know, homeopaths in the UK would treat people for everyday ailments. But they're also, in addition, they've got clinics where they're treating tuberculosis, they're treating cancer, they're to, you name it, and getting incredible results, um, which shows you the potential. Yeah. And, and so the more I got into it, the more I realized that there was to it. 
And, and so that became my, you know, my kind of career and my passion for about 15 years. I became a homeopathic practitioner. I also became a teacher and educator. I wanted to help people to learn how they could use it for themselves. And I also started to train practitioners. I used to run a training school. Um, so I became reasonably well known in that, you know, fairly small bubble, if you like. I wrote a few books uh, around homeopathy. And then I started to realize that um, homeopathy on its own is not a total healing system. Mm -hmm. It's a wonderful healing system. Mm -hmm. But there are times when people need other things as well, myself included. So, you know, when you get immersed in something like that, you, for a while, you tend to think it's the only thing that yeah. anybody yeah. will need, you know. And I can see that that's a natural part of the learning curve. Um, so there was a time when if I ever got sick, I would just take homeopathy. And to be honest, sometimes it would work and sometimes it didn't. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> sometimes I was just basically passing the time taking homeopathy, waiting for nature to do, to do, the, <laughs> yeah, to do its thing, which is what we do with normal medicine, right? A lot of the time, yeah. it's like, you know, you, you take the antibiotics or whatever and you get well in about the same time as it would have taken if you hadn't done anything, you know, quite often. So, but there are other occasions where I got quite ill and I needed to look outside of homeopathy in order to get help for myself which was actually good for me as a practitioner it was humbling and it you know it forced me to kind of open my horizons I remember one occasion when I got um, sick in the winter I was living in Cumbria it was very very cold damp conditions which I've learned don't suit my constitution that well <laughs> <laughs> so this is one thing that I've learned about staying healthy is you've, you've got to get to know your own system because they're all, we're all individual and unique. And I discovered that my constitution type is, is sensitive to cold, damp conditions. I can tolerate a certain amount of that, but not too much. Yeah. And it was starting to get to me. And you combine that with um, a period of overwork. So your energy is going down. I was overworking. I was really stretching myself. And then I had some relationship breakup grief. Mm -hmm. And I learned from Chinese medicine that grief goes to the lungs, mm -hmm. which is very interesting. And uh, I developed a cold, which became a chest infection, which eventually became a pneumonia. Wow. And the homeopathy didn't work. Mm -hmm. And so I wasn't just self-prescribing. I had, you know, homeopathic colleagues who were prescribing for me. And I mean, I was literally on my knees. And it's, you know, it's interesting to me, Vicky, but now I, I, I listen to occasionally people describe their experience of, of COVID, you know, getting sick with this. And they, you know, they relate a story of which is like, I just want people to know how, how serious this is, because this is how ill I was. And when I read it, I think, well, that's not half as ill as I was. <laughs> when, that time when I had pneumonia, you know, I was literally, I, I remember crawling on my hands and knees to the bathroom to cough up phlegm and blood, you know, I was so, so sick. Now, most people would think, well, you idiot, why were you not in the hospital? <laughs> and there's a, there's a part of me that thinks that too. And yet something in me knew that I could get through that. That's really all I can say about it. And if I didn't trust that, then of course I would have, I would have just taken the normal route and I would have been in hospitalized probably on heavy duty antibiotics. Um, but the homeopathy wasn't uh, helping sufficiently. I was taking some strong herbs as well, and they were kind of keeping me at a certain level, but I couldn't throw it off. Yeah. And again, by some amazing, I, I've learned that at times like this, you basically got to hand it over. You yeah. got to, you got to ask for help in whatever way makes sense to you. So that's what I did. I just kind of put out, look, I, I'm out of my depth here. <laughs> Show me, you know, just give me some kind of nudge as to what direction to go in. And what, came into my consciousness was an acupuncturist who I'd heard about, who lived actually not far from where I lived in Cumbria, who I hadn't visited before. And I managed to get an appointment and uh, drag myself to her clinic. And it was amazing because without, actually, without asking me any questions, so I was used to the homeopathic way of case taking. We ask a lot of questions, build right. up a picture. She just sits there very quietly holding my pulse. Initially trying to find my pulse. <laughs> Where's your pulse? <laughs> she said it was like it really, it was so feeble, she could barely find it. She had to really feel around. So she's just feeling my pulse and she sits there very, very quietly. And 
I remember what she did. She she did very little um, needling. She she put one or two needles, but it was almost nothing. And then she she got this uh, dried herb that they use, rolled up into little balls, and she started to put it on my skin. And they they turn it into a little bonfire. I don't know if you've ever had this. No. It's called mox, moxibustion. So they, the dried herb gets rolled up, and they put it on an acupuncture point, but they don't stick a needle in. They set fire to it. Wow. And it slowly, slowly burns down, takes a matter of, you know, less than a minute. And then at the point where it really starts to hurt, you tell her and she pulls it off. Oh, OK. <laughs> I'd never had anything like this before, but I was very intrigued just by the whole ritual. I just thought this is my kind of healing ritual, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So she did this a number of times like this until she was satisfied by the and she was testing the pulse in between each treatment and she could start to feel that the energy was starting to flow again. And this really impressed me because she had a way of reading what was happening energetically that I didn't have as a homeopath at that time. So I was very intrigued by this. And at a certain point she concluded that that was enough for today. And she sent me home and within 24 hours, I was throwing a raging fever, raging fever. I was sweating buckets and I was so impressed. <laughs> <laughs> oh. I, I, yeah, I was thrilled because I knew enough to know that that was a healing response. Right. And I've, you know, I've seen similar things happen when I've given homeopathic remedies to people. Mm. If someone's been in the midst of an acute and been, the body's been struggling to throw it off. Sometimes that's what will happen when a person takes a good homeopathic remedy is that the suddenly the energy starts to move, the temperature goes up and or there's some kind of elimination, sweating or something of that kind. So I had everything, I had sweating, fever, the whole thing. Wow. Lasted about 48 hours and, and I knew within 24 hours that I was getting better. And, wow. and then, you know, within a matter of days, it was all cleared up. Sorry, my son has just decided to print. <laughs> Joys of having kids at home schooling. Yeah. <laughs> I, had, I had a sort inkling that this might happen. I'm kind of impressed that the, um, but this has actually stayed going, but you know, I'll cut this bit out, clearly. Right, hopefully that's it. <laughs> okay. I'm just gonna put it outside the door actually. <laughs> uh, what fun, kids at home. Sorry. All right. So you were better after Yeah, I got I got I got better from the from the acupuncture, well, the moxibustion treatment and the, the, the Chinese medical understanding that um, this practitioner had. So that opened my whole, my eyes to the, the power of being able to diagnose energetically what was going on. Um, and I that led to a whole new course of interest and study for me. But also subsequent to that, I, I was noticing in my practice that a lot of people that I worked with who came to me initially as a kind of substitute GP, you know, a lot of people come to homeopathy or things like that because the doctors hasn't been able to help them. You know, it's only helped them up to a point. So we'd start off by working with someone's migraine or, you know, menstrual pain or whatever it happened to be. But then with a significant number of those people, as I got to know them, then they would start to reveal that they were also struggling with other things and in other ways. And it often included uh, a psychological and emotional component. Right. Um, and that was something that was also, you know, that was something that I was up against too. You know, I struggled also emotionally, psychologically from time to time. And I felt that the just the things that I'd learned as a homeopath on their own were not sufficient. Mm -hmm. that I wanted to be able to help on a deeper level in a more sustainable way. So that set me on a whole journey of um, learning again for about another eight or nine years. So I, the, the homeopathy actually gradually fell away from my practice. And I started to learn and incorporate um, ways of working with people for what I called emotional release. Mm -hmm. I just saw that most people who are struggling internally, let's say, mm -hmm. they're struggling with how they feel emotionally. They want to feel different. They want to feel how they used to feel or how they know they could feel. And they're not feeling that, you know, they're feeling some other way. So I, I, I retrained in a number of different disciplines to try and help people psychologically and emotionally. And I did find things that were helpful um, along the way, but again, they were all kind of partial and I felt like I was piecing it together. So it's been an ongoing journey. Um, and then, 
you know, more recently, I've learned some things that are more helpful in that area, which you know about as well, um, <laughs> <laughs> which uh, goes under the name of three principles understanding or the inside out understanding, learning about how our psychologically emotional experience actually gets created. Mm -hmm. That was a missing piece for me, which has proven to be so, so helpful. Um, so I, I, interestingly now in, in the light of this last, what's happened this last year, I feel like I've kind of come full circle because I'm now sharing homeopathy again. I started to teach some classes just, just for fun initially. I thought it'd be a fun thing to do and I thought it might be helpful and reassuring for people to know that they could have remedies in the home, you know, that they could use. Uh, and I've been amazed at the response. It's just been way beyond what anything that I expected in yeah. terms of the number of people who've been interested. So that says to me that I, you know, it's timely and people do want to learn how to be more, more resilient, really. And I think that that's one thing that when I look back now, and it's, you know, it's 43 years, I, I've got a decent span of time to look back on. I feel that one of the, what I've really learned is, is that, first of all, that we, we, we can, we are more resilient than we think we are. Mm. But we can we can either work with that that natural inbuilt resilience or we can work against it and a lot of what we learn to do without even realizing that we've learned it is that we're working against it we're not working with what we were gifted with so most of what i've learned that's been really helpful is i've just learned how to work with my own body and my own mind and my own uh, emotional uh, feeling states so that i'm not fighting i'm not in conflict with myself and i'm not in conflict with my own body at least not so much. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And oh, there's so much in what you've said there. Oh, it's just... <sighs> Something you said right at the beginning, I think, will really kind of spark people's interest, I think. And you said something about that you, you know, when COVID came along, you weren't, you weren't afraid. And if, and if other people could, could have that lack of fear, it would change their experience. Mm. And I see that too, like very, very clearly that I haven't feared COVID, that, that, that I have this knowing, I suppose it's that, it's that knowing that, that you've been talking about that, that has meant that you've known what to do, who to reach out to, you know, you've always known how to, to kind of deal with your own health, which many people don't have. Yeah. Yeah. And I suppose it, it's, it, you know, how, what, what, how do you, how would you kind of explain to people how they can get in touch with that? Because yeah, we're right. so, I think we're so, indoctrinated into the idea that there's some if there's something wrong with us we need to we need someone else to do something about it if it's health you know health related stuff yeah that's right that's that and it is it is a kind of indoctrination that we've just been led to believe mm. that that we we can't help ourselves and that we're not resilient and that we we must always defer to some external authority mm. um but what if that wasn't true mm. you know one of the kind of things that I've, I've liked to ponder occasionally throughout my life is what if I lived on a little island somewhere where there weren't any doctors yeah. and, there, and there wasn't a, a hospital or you know there weren't emergency services and there wasn't a GP that you could just go to what would you do mm. and what would any of us do mm. in that you know supposing you lived as part of a community and you had access to um, water and food and herbs and plants and you know what would you do you'd get creative <laughs> because you'd have to yeah. you know yeah. you would you know you would things would happen you would suffer sunburn or heat stroke or somebody would get bitten by some something poisonous from time to time you'd eat something that didn't agree with you and get sick and this is part of the human experience is that we interact with the environment and we and we we get sick as a consequence but also to me part of the ex part of the experience of being here on the earth is that we've been gifted with the means to heal as well, not just to get sick, but also to heal. Mm. And we can also learn how to interact with the environment in a way which, which promotes and preserves health. 
so it's just a learning. It's something that once you're open to learning that, then it's an ongoing lifelong learning. And obviously there are always some people who are a few steps ahead who've, you know, they've trodden that path and who you can learn from. Mm. And I've been very grateful for the teachers that I've come across who I've learned from. And then, you know, it's a knowledge that can be passed on, which is how I would say traditional societies have always done it. There will be people who are like the keepers of that knowledge who then pass it, they make sure, they make it their business to make sure that it's passed on before they die so that that, that knowledge stays alive. You know, it's a living tradition. Um, and unfortunately, that chain has been broken, you know, in a lot of our culture right now, but not completely. Yeah, I don't think completely. So there are little shoots of it still. And it doesn't take much, you know, when someone someone's interest awakens and they discover, you know, they start to discover that that they can do something for themselves or, you know, the first time that if someone gets a homeopathic kit in the home, maybe as a new parent, you know, as it's natural to be anxious about your kids when they're sick. But as a new parent, if you've got a remedy kit and you one day you, you tentatively try it out, you know, before the antibiotics, you think, well, I'm just going to give it 24 hours and I'll give them belladonna first. And you see it work, you know, that's like a miracle. Yeah. It's, yeah. And it's, and, but that, that experience, <clears throat> it gives you, so it deepens your faith yes. <clears throat> and your trust in what's possible. <clears throat> so the next time you're more likely to go in that, you know, in that direction first as a first result, it's like, well, it was great here. What about here? Maybe it can help with this as well. So that's how, it, you know, you just got to start where you are, basically. Yeah. And there's, and, and, you know, there's so much empowerment in that. I think for me, um, the first thing I kind of came across in that sort of area was uh, essential oils. And, you know, just, just having a kit of essential oils in the house that when the kids weren't feeling well or when I wasn't feeling well or whatever, that, that I could kind of go, oh, oh, there's an option. Like, I don't have to ring the doctor straight away. There's something I could try. And it's almost like, it's kind of exciting to think, maybe there is a different way because for me you know I, I was went to university I did a science degree very scientific kind of led thinking and you know it, it, I had to see evidence had to you know really I don't know believe the science behind things or you know I had to and for me the idea of herbs and homeopathy and all that was just like yeah nice that not for me you know like that's just I'll just go to the doctor thanks and and I think you know having the essential oils really opened my eyes to the fact that 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 I didn't have to give my power away to somebody else that there was some there was something within me that could guide me mm. and I didn't know what that was because I didn't I didn't have any understanding of the three principles back then but it was just this um yeah, real natural sort of all that essential oil feels like the right thing for me today. Like I'm, I've got a bit of a cold, so I'm going to go for that. And no, it doesn't seem like much, does it? No. Like, that inner knowing, let's call it that, it seems almost insignificant. Yeah. And yet that's the crucial ingredient. Yeah. And it turns out we all have it. Yeah. And as you said, the more that you, the more you kind of experiment with that, the more open you are to the idea that maybe I do know some stuff that I don't think I know, or, you know, how would I know? Because for me, it was always like, well, how would I know that? Because nobody's taught me that. So I possibly, I can't possibly know that. Whereas now I'm much more kind of, well, I don't know how I know this, but that feels like the right thing to do. I'm going to give it a try. It's that openness to, to there being an, a different way from that, which you've been told, I guess. It is. And it's also recognizing that there's a diff there's a gulf of there's a huge difference between knowledge as in the, as in information yeah. versus knowing. Yeah. So the knowledge is external, which I mean, is not to say that it's not valid and sometimes it's very useful, but it's a different thing. It's in a different category. Yeah. And what, we're, what I'm talking about here and what we're talking about is inner knowing is an is an underused faculty in western society but it's something that traditional societies have relied on more than anything else and that we still have the capacity to rely on and in fact i would say in current times it might be the only thing we got that's going to get us out of this mess <laughs> really 
Um, <clears throat> I remember, <clears throat> excuse me, years ago, I remember reading the books of Carlos Castaneda. Don't know if you ever read any of any of his books. There's a lot of them, but right. he was uh, he was an anthropology uh, PhD anthropology student um, in California, and he decided to go to Mexico and try and study what the shamans. You know, he, he, he was looking to find a shaman who he could study some of their you know ways of life and practices and so on, and kind of unbeknownst to him, he kind of got tricked into becoming the shaman's apprentice. Brilliant. So he underwent, you know, basically his own shamanic journey under the guidance of his tutor, who he nicknamed Don Juan. And, uh, and it led to many, many books recounting the, the, the story. Some people claim it was a fictitious story. It may have been, I don't know, but if it was, it, he had an amazing <laughs> capacity to tap into some you know knowledge that was beyond his own imagination but i remember one of the th one of the tasks that his teacher set him early on was they went they went hiking out in the hills and his and he gets to a point of exhaustion more or less and the teacher says to him you've got to go up right to that kind of place where there's these flat rocks and you've got to find the power spot in the landscape he's he's an intellectual this guy <laughs> You know, he's a PhD student. He's like, what the hell is he talking about? You know, power spot. How am I supposed to know? You know, where's it marked on the ground? Yeah. He wouldn't tell him anything else about it other than there's a power spot. Your job is to find it. Wow. And he leaves him to stew in his own juices, you know, for a couple of days. And uh, he drives himself crazy trying to figure it out. And of course, he, he doesn't succeed. And eventually he just gives up in despair and literally collapses with exhaustion. And when he finally wakes up, Don Juan sat next to him, laughing his head off. It's like, I see you found the spot. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Which of course drove him crazy because- <laughs> He didn't know how. He didn't know how, but yeah. he, he, didn't, he didn't even know whether to believe that this was the spot. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. yeah. He's just saying that. Could I have collapsed anywhere? And that <laughs> would have been, you know. <laughs> but this was his introduction to a different way of discovering and a different way of knowing and also what he was introducing him to was the fact that we can interact with the landscape that we're not separate from it mm. we can interact with the environment and if we open ourselves to that possibility it has it's rich in wisdom and intelligence and because we're part of that you know we come out of the same landscape and we can there's there's a way that we can open ourselves to it and be informed by it and it, and it can inform us in a lot of different ways. And to me, I think that's, that's what I would really um, credit my own ability to navigate my own health is, is really to do with that. It's, I've learned to listen to what things are not so good for me. Yeah. You know, like I said to you, like the cold, damp climate, I just, there was a certain point I just knew I needed to leave Cumbria. Yeah. <laughs> you know, there were things I could do to mitigate it, you know, to kind of keep myself healthy, despite the fact that I didn't really like the climate. But then there's a certain point where you realize actually no i need to move somewhere that's just a bit milder climate it's not quite so so damp um there are things like that that where you realize there are maybe things that you've been eating that don't really agree with you mm. um or you know you, you fall into a habit of eating or drinking or you know just doing certain things at a certain point it just starts to dawn on you you don't feel so good after you do that yeah. you know and you hadn't noticed before but when you stop and pay attention, you, you just start to notice it's like, my, you know, when I go out for it and have a few drinks now, my recovery time seems to be getting a bit longer. <laughs> I remember noticing that, you know, when I grew up, we just used to go out and get blind drunk on a Friday night and a Saturday. That was what everybody did, you know, that I knew. And then there was a point where I realized that I wasn't doing it so often by this time. But if I did drink a bit more than was, you know, was, was good for me, I really suffered for it afterwards in a way that I didn't used to. But I paid attention to that. I didn't override it. You yeah, know, I didn't just yeah. take, I, didn't, I didn't just take things to get over the hangover. <laughs> yes, yeah. You know, I yeah. actually paid it. To, I realized I need to stop doing that. <laughs> my body doesn't seem to like it. So I'm my, that's that to me is when you know you, you just naturally modify your behavior and you and you come back more into alignment with what would be healthy for you now at this stage in your life. And it changes, you know, as we go through different stages of our life. I love that, that, that the whole idea that 
you know what was what was good for us a week ago or even a day ago doesn't have to be the thing that's good for us today it's that really like you say really connecting in really tuning into what our body's telling us and not dismissing it because it's so easy to get into that habit of um experiencing something and it's not convenient because we need to go to work or we need to deal with the kids or we need to cook dinner or whatever it might be and so we just dismiss it we we take a tablet or we you know i mean this is my experience of yeah, we push through somehow yeah of just of just totally ignore like really dismissing what my body's effectively trying to tell me you know i've got, I've got a headache oh it's so inconvenient to have a headache i need to just take some tablets and carry on doing what i'm doing rather mm -hmm. than listening to you know seeing that as my body trying to tell me something and and mm -hmm. that's something i don't I never know what that something is, but to be in, to, to stop and just consider that it, those symptoms are just my body's way of telling me that, that something's off. Even if I just stop for five minutes to consider that rather than reaching for the tablets, I'm not dismissing. I'm not, I'm not overriding what my, my what my body and my experience is telling me. That's it. You, 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 as soon as that little shift has occurred, you, you've you've changed your relationship to your body and yeah. and the intelligence that's behind it. You know, we stop seeing it as just a pesky symptom that you want rid of. Yeah. And you start going, oh, maybe it's maybe it's telling me something helpful. Yeah. I wonder what that is. You know, you get open to learning, mm -hmm. and as soon as we open ourselves to learning, it's like this. And there's there's this library available to us, which is internal which is incredible. And it's, it's a lifelong learning. It's, it's ongoing. But I think, yeah, there's, to me, there's two common traps that we fall into. One is that we don't listen to that in a knowing. We override it, as you say. The other is that we do listen to what other people say and yes. do yeah. and tell us. And we think that we should just adopt that because it seems to be working for them. So why wouldn't it work for me? Or they seem to know better than I do. Therefore, I should, you know, just abdicate my own self responsibility and and do what they're suggesting. That's the other big trap, yeah. is that um, and that's the conditioning aspect that you said earlier, which is we we tend to hand over very very readily the idea to someone else or just to mimic what someone else has done. Um, I mean, another thing that I would that I've occasionally dropped into conversation that kind of shocks people. I've never been on a diet in my life, ever. And, I, and I'm pretty sure I never will. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Who knows? I could change my mind next week. But it's never made sense to me to go on a, any kind of prescribed diet. Or, the, you know, that what I mean by that is one that you might find in a book or yeah. Yeah. that someone else has, someone basically has gone through their own healing journey and they've realized something that worked for them. Mm -hmm. Why would that work for me? Yeah. Yeah, and that's so interesting, isn't it? Because how how is it that you i mean i'm really fascinated by you know how is it that you ended up knowing all of this from a, such a young age the you know that there was a part of you that was obviously you know quite loud about the fact that you didn't need to follow the the kind of i don't know set path almost i wasn't really loud i was kind of quietly stubborn <laughs> 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 that's more my more my method if you like um but yeah i've been quite um i've been quite clear i suppose about it and and it feels solid to me you know it doesn't feel like something flimsy yeah. so and and that has just developed over time and, and with experience how that developed or how it is that i came to have that initially i i really can't say and that, that to me is a, a little bit mysterious, but I know I'm not the only one. No, no. And I think it's really interesting, just, just, just occurred to me, you know, maybe we all have that, but in different areas, like we're very certain about certain things yeah. in certain areas. And for you, it was health. Yeah. For me, you know, I've always, I've always known that I know where I'm going. Like I have this kind of very clear, solid thing inside of me that I know I'll never get lost. Mm. It's just a fact, you know? Like, the opposite of what a lot of people will yeah. say, isn't it? 
yeah, yeah, exactly. So I wonder if maybe all of us have something and it's worth, you know, noting what that is for all of us because that is our knowing, but it maybe is just brighter. It's in yeah, exactly. It's more visible in this area. Yeah. So I think that's, that to me makes sense and that rings true. I think this is just an area where that inner knowing was very visible to me. Yeah where I could repeatedly test it out and, and kind of exercise that muscle. But yeah. as you say, we've all got some area where yeah. we know what yeah. we know and we would kind of stand solid in that knowing, yeah. at least in that area. Yeah. Well, yeah. If, you, if, you, if, you, if you can connect to that feeling of certainty in that area, maybe it can extend out. <laughs> exactly, exactly yeah. what I'm thinking. Yeah, maybe it can infiltrate other areas like your health, for example. Yeah. yeah. Wow. That seems totally feasible to me. Yeah, and what a, and what a, what a gift to see that actually. You know, like I say, you know, this is all. This is a, an entirely developing area for me within the health sort of arena. But, but, like I say, the the idea of getting lost. I mean, my my nickname when I was a child was pigeon. Like I, I'm like a homing pigeon. I, you know, put me somewhere. <laughs> drop me somewhere and I will find my way home I love that yeah. and yeah that's pretty cool to see that that's 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 actually working it's the same faculty isn't it it's the same faculty as what I'm talking about it's like you know throw me in any situation with some health challenge yeah. and I'm confident that I can find my way home <laughs> yeah. in the same way yeah yeah yeah. And maybe if the only thing that people take out of this conversation is that, you know, there's there's something, there'll be an area in in every person's life where they feel very confident that they can cope. They can yeah. they can deal with whatever is thrown at them in that particular area. And to yeah. consider that, that that is your knowing and that that extends to everything. Right. That's it. It's just that there's some areas where we haven't utilised it. We yeah. Haven't. You know, we haven't given it the uh, opportunity to shine in those areas. Yeah. <coughs> so hence, we've had to rely on something else. <clears throat> yeah. Wow. It's a nice thought, isn't it? That it, it's a very empowering and hope, hopeful um, okay. possibility. But to me, it's a very realistic one also. Yeah. Yeah. Um, wow. Well, this has been a pleasure. And I wonder if, if people would like to find out more about your, you know, the courses that you run and um, everything else that you've been sort of sharing, how can they find out about you and work with you? Yeah, the main place um, would be my website, which is theinsightspace.com. So people can have a look there. It's always like most websites out of date and there's things missing, but you, you'll you get the general idea. And there's a place that people can contact me directly from the website. Great. Yeah, and I have to say that I, you know, I've done your level one homeopathic um, training mm -hmm. course, which I found absolutely brilliant. Again, so empowering just to sort of, you know, my son came home from the park a couple of days ago, having fallen off the climbing frame, and I was like, I know what I need to do. I need to give him Anka, and just, you know, just having a little kit in the house, as you say, um, that you can turn to, is just, yeah super empowering and, and sweet. I think so. I think if people you know if people want to start taking more charge you know more responsibility for their own and their family's health that's as good a place as any you start with something that's easy and accessible you know that you could pick up and learn quite quickly you know that was a like six-week course wasn't yeah, it brilliant. But the, the idea was that people would know enough to be able to like you just did to yeah. use things in the home as and when they when then they pop up yeah. but once you have that experience the experience then it gives you that sense of Ooh, what else you know <laughs> exactly exactly yeah. and it's that yeah. almost like developing that muscle yeah of 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 trust that there, yeah. there could be some other possibilities outside of the traditional medical model i guess yes yeah and again it's not to dismiss you know what the what modern medicine is very good at certain things you know there are things that i would really you know if i go out and break a leg yeah. i'm gonna go get yeah, I'm not going to stay at home and wrap a bandage around it myself, you know, yeah. so common sense prevails in, in my world. Um, but I think a lot of the things that people end up struggling with, a lot, oftentimes it's things that they could actually deal with at home 
or they could, you know, they could learn and go on a learning journey. And through learning how to be different in relationship to your own health, a lot of those things will over time will just fall away because of the reason that we discussed earlier is that oftentimes our, our body's developing symptoms just to try and alert us to the fact that we're moving away from optimum health. Yeah. You know, it's just trying to get our attention. It's trying to be helpful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we're just obliterating the symptoms and go away stop bothering me you know if we, we just start listening and we make some little adjustments after a while the body will say thank you you know i appreciate that i i won't give you that headache this week yeah yeah and it won't escalate into something even bigger i mean that's yeah. that's, that's the you get a positive feed, feedback loop going yeah. yeah amazing yeah thank you vicky oh, for thank you so much for your time my pleasure and uh, I will see you very soon. You will, very soon. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Ian. Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye.